Good morning and welcome. I would like to uh, welcome also those that, who are joining us online this morning. As this is the first Sunday of the month, I will read the land acknowledgement. We want to acknowledge the territory of the Anishabek Nation, the people of the three fi fires known as Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi Nations, and further give thanks to the Chippewas of Saugeen and the Chippewas of Nawash, known collectively as the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, as the traditional keepers of this land. A few announcements this morning. This week, Jan Wednesday, uh, Tuesday, I think, January the 19th at 1 o'clock, the WMS will be meeting, and the responsive word is stranger. It is a time of year for the annual dues, so start saving for that $8 membership fee now. <laughs> um, and I know that the WMS would welcome new members, so if you would like to be part of our WMS, please uh, feel free to turn up on January the 9th at 1 p.m. We're going to have a fellowship event on January the 17th. It's a, a, a Wednesday at noon. The quilters and the men's work crew get together every Wednesday, and to celebrate the new year, they're going to have a potluck. But we would like to invite anybody else that would f like to join us in Joy's Potlucks to come along as well and, uh, and, and enjoy some fellowship on Wednesday at noon. Also on Wednesday, our youth group that we've been so looking forward to having is going to be starting up. Uh, Tristan will, has organized a youth meeting, which is going to begin at 3.30, and in typical pre Presbyterian fashion, and not to be outdone by the quilters, there will be a meal served to those young, growing people. If you know someone, but in the ages of the 13 to 18 age group, have them contact Tristan in advance or leave a message at the office so we know how many we will be feeding. And then, the, then on the 19th, this is a busy time coming ahead, we have a fellowship event for everyone. We're having a dinner and a movie. And that is Friday, January 19th, starting at 5.30. We will have uh, the meal in the Christian Education Hall. And it's going to be a meal of ham and scalloped potatoes and I believe carrots, uh, although my bulletin board shows peas, but I think it's going to be carrots. Um, and it's going to be a lot of fun, I hope. So put it on your calendar uh, January 19th. And there is a sign-up sheet at the office so we can know a, how many people might be attending this event. So if you could sign that and just give us an indication of how many in your family will be attending, it, it helps us plan for how much to feed and how much to set up for. And as always with fellowship events, we ask that you bring your own dishes and cutlery so that it makes the working, the people that are working uh, have less to do when it's cleanup time. There is also a sign-up sheet at the office, as well as signing up that you're coming, that you could sign up to say that you would help with the preparing of the meal and the cleaning up of the, the meal afterwards. So if you are willing to do that, please sign those sheets. Uh, <clears throat> let me just... Oh yes, and the last thing I want to announce is that we are planning to have Scenes of Wonder again next year. It'll probably be the weekend of the Santa Claus Parade, well in advance of Christmas, so if you are tidying up your nativity uh, and creche displays for this year, make sure you tuck them at the end of the cupboard that you can get at easily so that we may borrow them during November to set up our Scenes of Wonder display. And uh, we are so happy that this is going to be reinstated because it was a wonderful um, 
experience for all of our community. And so we will uh, hopefully have a large display once again. And that um, can include things as small as a Christmas ornament that depicts the nativity uh, up to as large as any uh, nativity that you may have uh, displayed in your home. Let us worship God. Good morning, and I extend, oh good, um, I'm not Ed, uh, I know a lot of people here will know me, but I see that since the last time I was here, there's many new faces in this congregation. I'm Reverend Scott Sinclair, formerly minister at, uh, here, and willing and able to cover for Ed Hoekstra when he takes a break. Who knew that he felt he would need to have a holiday after the Christmas season? Um, but we, we do let him do that. I think it's a blessing that we can be here gathered like this in worship. And, um, and I hope that all of us here will find this a spiritual, uh, a meaningful time as we worship together as, in God's, uh, as God's community. Our, our call to worship is printed in the bulletin. We'll say these words together. Now I point out that in this call to worship, we all say the first line together. It's in the bulletin and it's on the screens. Our Lord's name will endure forever. All nations are blessed in him. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. May his glory fill the whole earth. All men and all men praise the Lord. And let us do that, praising the Lord. Our opening hymn, selection number 170 in the hymn book, also on the screens, if that's good enough. Um, if it's comfortable to do so, please rise and we'll sing this together. What star is this? Please be seated. <clears throat> we bring our hearts, our souls, our spirits together in a time of prayer. Let us pray. God of light and life, we praise you for the amazing depth of your creation and the mysteries of the cosmos. 
We praise you for the wonders of the earth that are around us and for the word made flesh in the child born in Bethlehem. Open our hearts and minds in this time of worship. Just as you led the Magi by the star, lead us by your spirit beyond the limits of this world's expectations to the life where you make all things new through Christ, our morning star. God of mercy and loving kindness, you sent Christ among us to be the light of the world and to reveal your love to all people. Yet our sins hide the brightness of your light that should shine through us. Forgive us the wasting of our gifts, ignoring cries of justice uh, for justice and harming the earth that you love, that you created. In your mercy, cleanse us and make us new. We bring ourselves to you in this time of worship for that purpose, Lord. Make us good. Through your grace we pray. Amen. And we can be assured of God's love and forgiveness that shine for us in Christ Jesus. As a new year unfolds, make a new beginning with God and with one another. May the peace of Christ be with us all. We do hold Sunday school during uh, our, in the midst of our services, and our friend Tristan, who's waving his hand in the front pew, it's a brave Presbyterian to be sitting in the front pew. If there are children who would like to follow Tristan now for a special time of Sunday school, he's the one to go. If you want to stay behind for a very erudite sermon coming up in a few moments, you're welcome to do that as well. Or you can sing during, apparently they stay for the song. Do what you want to do. It's a free country, but what I'm going to do is join with the choir and you singing selection number 173, We Three Kings. The words are also on the screen. If it's comfortable to do so, let's rise and we'll sing We Three Kings number 173.
Our scripture lesson for today is Isaiah 60, verses 1 to 6. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from far away, and your daughters shall be carried in their nurses' arms. And then, then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you. The wealth of the nation shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you. The young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. Our second reading is from Matthew 2, verses 1 to 12. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star in the east and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. For you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the Magi and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen in the east, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of the Lord.
It has been quite some time since I preached here because I'm not the usual preacher. Um, and I do remember, well, it was August, the last time I preached at St. Andrews, and it was only down, well, not only, but it was in the service down in the fellowship hall. And I'm not expecting anybody to remember. It's a preaching after all. But um, I did, uh, I do remember. I, I mean, I checked my notes to make sure I didn't come and say the same thing today. Uh, but I'm gonna say a bit of the same stuff. <laughs> I do remember then referring to pilgrimage. Um, I, ha I have uh, considered myself a pilgrim uh, a, a few times in, in my history. And I know I made, uh, well, because in reading the story of the Magi, I can't help but be, be reflecting on that sense of pilgrimage that the Magi take. When you're uh, pilgrimaging, when you're, when you're walking, um, you, you do a lot of thinking. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you know, the, the landscape does change frequently, and the people that you're seeing and, and being with change frequently, but you're still doing a lot of walking, and you're walking, and, and you're walking, and, and you're walking. And so your, your mind just takes you places, and, and, you, and your brain just keeps thinking. You think a lot, you meditate a lot, sometimes you cry. You sing every now and then, if, uh, if, if, if that's what helps you. Um, but a lot of my thinking on the last time I did the Camino in Spain was... Uh, what was reflecting on an article that somebody sent me, I think it was a member of um, the congregation that I was serving at the time, an article about pilgrimage written by a fellow named Paolo Caolo. Uh, that's a difficult name to pronounce, it's Portuguese. And Paolo Caolo is credited with really bringing that Spain pilgrimage, El Camino de Santiago de Compostela, and I do challenge everybody to say that five times fast, El Camino de Santiago de Compostela. I mean, if you have trouble with words in the Bible, try and say that so many times. Anyway, um, I, he's credited with bringing that pilgrimage uh, experience really into the modern context because he wrote a book about it back in 1987. And since then, so many more people have gone to Spain to do that pilgrimage to uh, El, uh, Santiago de Compostela. Oddly enough, I mean, the book that he, in English, the book is called The Pilgrimage, but he wrote it in Portuguese. And the, um, the literal translation of the Portuguese title is Diary of a Magician. And the word magi shows up in that. And so that, that I, I, my mind started going back there when thinking about what I could preach on today, this being the, well, it's not really the, um, the uh, Epiphany Sunday. It is, but we can celebrate it today because it was yesterday, January 6th, and we didn't get together. So I'm talking about pilgrimage. I'm talking about the showing up of the magi at the birth of Jesus Christ. The journal article I read by him was about making the distinction between a tourist and a traveler. I think a lot of us have been traveling. We get on trips. We are able to get away from Own Sound. Not that Own Sound is a bad place and we want to get away, but that we know there are other things out there that we want to see, especially this time of year when we are looking forward to, well, winter will arrive. I'm pretty sure they keep promising me that. There will be snow. There will be blizzards. And some of us like to be in other places like Jamaica and Costa Rica. Um, but... Um, uh, we, we, we do travel, and, and I think we must travel and tour other parts of the world, if for no other reason, just to because there's other parts out of the world out there that we should know about. And since I do it frequently enough, I read a little bit about 
um, the, the dynamics of it, the sustainability of it. My most recent trip was to Costa Rica, and Costa Rica is so proud of advertising that they are uh, sustainable. They, they, their ecotourism is really big down there. And I think the word ecotourism on Costa Rica is as valuable as the word um, organically grown on the carrots. Uh, in other words, I'm not exactly sure what they mean by that, but they do say they are a very sustainable in their tourism, and, and I like that. I read a lot about that sort of stuff, and I think we all should, if we're going to do something, take advantage of the privilege and the blessing that we have in our comfortable economic and, uh, and social standing to be able to go to these other places. Let's do it with respect and responsibility. The article um, by, by, by Keolo, though, was talking about the difference between being a tourist and being a traveler. And what he liked to point out is that the tourist is the person that has an agenda, has a schedule, has an itinerary, is going to make sure that they check off every little point and everything's lined up because they want to know what's going to happen. And when something happens that they weren't planning on, oh, it messes things up terribly. That's a tourist. The traveler is the type of person who just says, hey, we're heading in that direction, and let's see what's out there. And there might be a nice restaurant, there might be a McDonald's, there might be a, a, a little hut that c kills a chicken for you right then and there, and, uh, and then you have to eat it while you can hear the other chickens being killed for the next customers. Uh, that's getting into too much detail, maybe. Um, but the traveler is that idea that just lets it happen as it happens. Um, I'm supposed to have a thing in my hand. Oh, hey, look, there it is. <laughs> Paul Thoreau said, tourists don't know where they've been. Travelers don't know where they're going. And that's kind of a neat thing to live by. Now, what I want to say, though, or what I want to point out, I don't want you to think that I don't think you should be a tourist. I think we should do whatever it takes for us to be able to get out and do these things. Get away from the normal. Challenge ourselves, because in challenging ourselves, uh, getting off of our easy chair and, and, and our flat screen TVs and our beer fridge and getting away from those things to do something that's completely out of the ordinary as far as we are concerned. It's a good thing to do, and if that means that we need somebody else to do the planning and somebody else to make sure the bus shows up on time, let's do that. Let's get out there. I have a friend, and I think a lot of the people in this congregation will know this person, so I won't mention him by name, but you know who he is. He loves, <laughs> he gets out. Um, he just loves to take the $5 bus to go from here over to Meaford or Collingwood for no other reason just to go to Meaford or Collingwood. He's a very friendly person, and he ends up talking to everybody. If you travel with him, plan on about twice as much time as you were planning on, because he talks to everybody, but he just gets out there and he sees them. He cannot afford to get to places like Florida, to get to places like Spain, to get to places like Jamaica. He, he doesn't even have a passport, but he knows that it's important for his well-being and I think it's good for the world that he will pay the five bucks to get on that uh, government subsidized transportation and get him somewhere other than Owen Sound. Not to say that Owen Sound is bad because it's a great place, <clears throat> but to say that it's something different and it's worth going there. So whatever we can do to get out there is what we should be doing and, and I commend people for doing that. I want to say too that um, I do both myself. I, I love the idea of saying with myself, uh, with, with myself or my spouse or my friends and say, let's just go to a particular place and see what happens. I was most surprised when a friend of mine said, we want to spend New Year's Eve in, uh, in, in Fort Myers, Florida. Well, given it's Florida, that's kind of nice, but Fort Myers, what's it famous for? Nothing. But he wanted to spend the time in Fort Myers, so we went. We had a great time. We were quite surprised to find out that in Fort Myers, there's things you can do on New Year's Eve. They weren't fun, but they were things you could do. Um, and, and, and so I want to say we should do this, the tour, and we should do this, the traveler, whatever it is we are able to do. But then, while well, reflecting on the Keolo's philosophy, I expanded upon it a bit and considered a third type of getting out there. We marked it odd that Keolo doesn't use this term in that article. There is the tourist that he talks about. There's the traveler he talks about. And I want to throw out there, there is the pilgrim. Because getting out there as a pilgrim 
has got a subtle difference to all of these other ways of going places. Other ways to define what I mean is that when you go somewhere outside your home, you may be changed. We don't expect that on a tour. We expect to follow the itinerary, see what's going to be seen, come home and say that was a lovely time. Sometimes it can happen on traveling because we can say, I didn't expect that. That was a very neat thing. I'm going to remember that. But it's a good idea to throw into our lives every now and then this idea of going on a pilgrimage. And by that, what I mean, the subtle difference in that is you, it's kind of a combination of the two because in a sense you do kind of know where you're going. You've got a destination in mind. But you're going there because you are expecting that either by being in that place or on the journey to get to that place, there will be a change. There will be a transformation. There will be something significant and important either happening to you in your life or happening to others that you can impact upon your, your, your journey. Gandalf says it to Frodo Baggins at some point. He says to Frodo Baggins, it's a dangerous business, Frodo, going out your door. You step onto the road, and if you don't keep your feet, there's no knowing where you might be swept off to. I don't know how many of you know Gandalf and uh, Frodo Baggins, uh, but that, that, it's an important movie. Um, and and if, you, if you do know the story of Gandalf and Frodo, then you kind of know. It's kind of a pilgrimage. They know where they're supposed to go. They kind of know that they're going to change the world by, by, by getting there, and they don't know what's going to happen in between, and then it's all about adventures. People who tourist are privileged and lucky. They're blessed to have the resources to be able to get outside their comfortable home and go see another part of the world. Often, but not always, unaware of how unique that privilege is compared to the vast majority of the world's population and even the financial and time resources of the people in their own community. I'm not saying people should not tour. I'm saying we can do so, but with respect to the fact that we are blessed and privileged to do so. So people who go on a journey and are changed by that journey, that's what I call pilgrims. And as I read and reread Matthew's story today about the Magi, through this lens, I ask myself, which of the categories do they fall into? And obviously, to me, I have to call the Magi pilgrims. They are from somewhere far away. We don't get a lot of information about them. Erroneously, a lot of times we call them kings, and there's nothing to indicate that they are kings. As a matter of fact, to call them kings, I think, is a bit of a mistake because if they are kings, what are they doing wandering away somewhere else? Three of them, as a matter of fact. Who's running the country at the time? If I was a king, I wouldn't be going away on something like this. They are called away. We do know that they are people of uh, affluence. They, they, are, they are people of substance because they can do this sort of thing and they can travel. Another one of the weird things we do know about them, that they, well, we don't know about them. We always show them on camels. And actually, it took me a while to find a good classical painting that didn't have camels in the picture because the Bible never mentions camels. And the Matthew story never mentions camels. The camels are part of that old Isaiah Old Testament prophecy that was also read this morning. And kings are mentioned in that prophecy too. And I think that's where we built up that tradition. But no, it just says the, 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 the Magi came from, from somewhere and, and, and they, they, they went to uh, Jerusalem first asking about, here's another thing too, it, it doesn't say in that passage in Matthew that the, king, that the Magi went to talk to Herod. It says they were just in Jerusalem asking about where is this baby and Herod finds out about it. When Herod hears about this, he calls. When Herod hears about this, he doesn't call up the Magi themselves to say, what's going on with you, this uh, talk about this baby that's going to be king? I thought I was king. Herod asks the chief priests and, and, the, uh, and the leaders, the church leaders of the time, he goes to them for verification of what's this story about a baby being born and where is it? It's the, it's the priests who know where it is. I find that kind of peculiar. They do know that something special is supposed to happen in Bethlehem. 
And for some reason, they never told Herod <laughs> until these strangers showed up from far away. These outsiders showed up. I think there's a cautionary tale in that, especially for the church that likes to think that we have the answers. We know everything. Well, if we do, we should be telling people everything we know about the good life, about, about Jesus, uh, about God. Uh, why does Herod have to go to them specifically and say, hey, I heard a rumor about this. Where is it? It's in Bethlehem. Well, um, they, 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 they're there. Uh, they, they find out about it. And again, this gets pointed out every year, I hope. If you've got a good minister, it gets pointed out every year. Um, that the Matthew story that we're reading today is about the Magi showing up at the birth of Jesus. It never mentions any shepherds. The Luke story about the birth of Jesus talks about shepherds showing up and never mentions any Magi. So we've got these two, they're not conflicting stories, and that's an important thing to say. They're not conflicting. I gotta look upon them as kind of complementary. The fact that both of those stories are written into our Bible, and when they're putting that together, the people who put it together weren't stupid. They weren't saying, hey, these stories aren't about the same thing. They put them together for an important theological reason. I believe shepherds and magi showing up in this same place is an important message to us. When we put Luke's and Matthew's gospels side by side, we see that the baby for which the magi searched was born not just for the good religious people who could come bearing gold and frankincense and myrrh and could have that opulent, not just for people who had the spare time to travel across the, 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 the area to, to find this miraculous birth. That's not who Jesus came for. Mind you, he did come for them, but not them exclusively. And that's one of those things that kind of sets the Christian religion apart from a lot of the other religions in the world. This is one that is meant for everybody. Just because you're rich doesn't mean you can't get the love of God. And certainly there is a preference for those of us who are not rich, for those of us who are not important, for those of us who are the low ones, low down. Jesus is for us as well as Jesus is for those of substance and importance and high and mighty. We put those two stories together. Jesus' story is about restoring all of us coarse, poor, lowly humans to a good relationship with God. A rich magi can be in a good relationship with God. They were called by that star to pilgrimage to that spot. The farmers, the shepherds, the smelly, low people were invited by the angels to come and see that child. I begin to realize through this that we need to turn to a new way of looking at our faith from that lowliness looking up. This turns everything on its head. Magi and farmers come to acknowledge a lowly born baby in a barn on the bottom. Most of religion defines reality from the top down. It begins with a transcendent God, big God, worship worthy God up there in heaven and then we try to explain everything about what God's doing down here in relationship to that God and we use angels and we use prophets and we use saints and we use erudite ministers but what Jesus actually taught was something much more I believe from the bottom going up Jesus taught us to find God incarnate in this world in our neighbor in the creation in the ordinary elements of this earth. That's a very different notion of religion. That is why we celebrate three kings paying homage to a poor baby in a feed trough standing beside the smelly, dirty sheep keepers. Our culture places most value on fame and power and money. We're much more fascinated by the celebrities and the so-called success than we are by the downward path of Jesus. The people that we see in the news are the ones who are deciding where to drop bombs in the world. 
The people we see in the news are the ones who are glamorous and glorious and making some sort of uh, statement about what the fashion for this year is. The people in the news are the ones who are, uh, are, are deciding what, 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 what technology is going to do for us and, and, and how they're going to fast track getting, um, uh, getting electric vehicles on the road for everybody. Those are the people that we see in the news. You and me don't get in the news much. I'm not, I'm not in the news. I'm a lowly person. The world's not that concerned or interested in me. And don't take this personally. It's not interested in you either as far as the world consciousness is concerned. We're the lowly people. But we are the ones that Jesus came for. And he's convincing us. And, and it's not just this Magi story, but it's the, the whole story of Jesus Christ and all that he does from that birth to that crucifixion, to me, it's trying to um, it, it tell us that it, it is us that make up the world. It's the lowly people that make up the, the community of God. And that's what God wants. He wants us to grasp that, to understand that, to live lives that show that we really believe that. We are the ones that God wants in the community. Sitting beside the rich people, the affluent people, the important people. Jesus has got a line uh, in Matthew 25. Remember there's that story about separating the sheep and the goats. That's a bad reference to do when we're, when we're talking about it. The story about separating the sheep and the goats. And, and, and uh, um, I probably shouldn't go there because I didn't have that in my script. Um, that you would, but maybe you know the story. That it, well, the, 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 In a nutshell, what Jesus says is, if you have done it to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you've done it for me. When did we feed the hungry? When did we clothe the naked? When did we visit the sick? And, and, and stuff like that. And, and, and uh, the, the Jesus says, when you didn't do it to the least of these, then you, you messed out on doing it to me. But if you did do it to the least of these, my children, you have done it unto me. Jesus, again, giving us that message that it's us, uh, the unexpected and if it's us, if you can accept that it's you, the unexpected, uh, the, the, the lowly, that Jesus wants, you got to accept that it's the one beside you too. It's the one behind you in the pews. you got to accept that it's the ones that you, you, you don't necessarily like. you, you got to accept that it's the people at that Christmas dinner who really made you angry. you got to accept that Jesus wants all of those, all of us. One of my favorite writers is Brian McLaren. And in the book, The Great Spiritual Migration, this quote, Growing numbers of us are acknowledging with grief that many forms of supremacy, Christian, white, male, heterosexual, and human, are deeply embedded not just in Christian history, but also in Christian theology. We are coming to see that in hallowed words like almighty, sovereignty, kingdom, dominion, supreme, elect, chosen, clean, remnant, sacrifice, Lord, and even God, Dangerous vices lie hidden. We are coming to see in the life and teaching of Christ, and especially in the cross and resurrection of Christ, a radical rejection of dominating supremacy in all its forms. And this is what I hope we can grasp from the story of the Magi showing up with the story of the shepherds. From the bottom, looking up, but all of us looking there. The Apostle Paul urges us, have among yourselves the same attitude that is also yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped. Rather, he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, coming in human likeness, and found human in appearance. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And how can you get more lowly than that? than to accept that Jesus, in all that he was, was willing to accept death rather than mete out death to those who were being violent towards him. Can we do that? Can, can, can we start looking at our faith and our life and our religion and, and our community more from the bottom up than from the top down? I think that's an important message for us to find in the story of the Magi. And I think that's all I wanted to say about that. Uh, we have another hymn, number 180, How Brightly Beams the Morning Star. It's on the screens.
comfortable to do so. So please rise and we'll sing this together. Let us pray. 
We do give thanks for the many ways that we have been blessed in this life, Lord, and we pray that by turning some of that back into your ministry, that it becomes a blessing to the world. Please use these things so that the ministry of this congregation beyond the walls and in this community and around the world can be blessed because we have been blessed. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We come together again in a time of prayer, settling our hearts and our spirits together so that we can approach and that we can approach God. Let us pray. God of all time and space, we gather in prayer and we recognize that our lives are but small details in the vast expanse of this world and even of your universe. We thank you for attending to the details of our little lives. We thank you for the year just past, for walking through hard days and uncertainties with us, for the gifts of encouragement and friendship that cheered us. We thank you for accomplishments in ministry and mission, for generosity offered to those in need, and for renewed commitment to gather together to celebrate your presence with us. As your spirit guides us into the future, our hearts kneel before you, O God. Receive our prayers, we pray. The year has ended that held so many sorrows and challenges for us. We remember dear ones who have died and pray for those who look ahead in loneliness or sadness. Lord, hear our prayers. We pray for those who have faced challenges in their own health, in the health of their families or friends. We pray for people who are in hospital and we pray for people who must be going through serious and difficult procedures to make them better. Lord, hear our prayers. Support each one who needs you. Support all of those of us who can be there to be there to be there with them. Our hearts kneel before you, O God. Receive our humble prayers. And Lord, we face the year ahead, aware of tensions around us. We seek your strength and guidance in each challenge that we will face. Draw near to each one who must confront changing circumstances in their personal lives and all who feel overwhelmed by the turmoil around the globe. Guide those for whom new opportunities appear and choices must be made. Our hearts kneel before you, O God. Receive our prayers. We do know of good things that we have certainly celebrated in the past year. We give thanks for how we have been blessed and how we have been able to turn those blessings around to others. We look forward into this new year with that sense of anticipation, a sense of hope that through all things, you are with us and things will come to good. Hear our prayers, Lord, for those things that we are looking forward to in the coming time. Lord, hear our thanks. Receive our humble prayers and encourage us onward in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is selection number 176, Songs of Thanksgiving, th Songs of Thankfulness and Praise. If it's comfortable to do so, we'll rise and sing these words together. Number 176.
Let us go from this place now, knowing that we have been blessed in so many ways. And we are called to share those blessings out there with all, the lowly and the high and mighty, all whom we encounter these weeks. Let us go with the love of God, with the grace and the forgiveness of Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit surrounding us always. Amen.